it going? Hey, I don't know if we have met before, unfamiliar face. My name is Graham Shelby. I serve on the leadership team here at the Porsche. I am so excited to be with y'all tonight. So if you're tuning in here with those who are seated around us in Houston, El Paso, Chicago, for some of my friends, uh, or wherever else you are tuning in, we are so excited for you to be here tonight. Hey, got a quick question. Has anybody moved recently? Anybody moved recently, right? It's the summer season, people are in transition, leases are coming up. If you have a truck, you just went up like three levels in popularity with your friends to becoming the best friend ever, right? Because now your truck is being used to move every couch in your friend group across, right? So let me tell you a story. I have moved three times in the last four years, three times in the last four years. And, uh, and really when I, when I was moving, I went through what I think all of us go through, right? Which is, I have to start chasing my mail. I have to start chasing my mail because I'm changing my permanent address. And so I'm trying to keep up with telling all of the necessary parties of where you need to send me the relevant mail. And then now I'm trying to sift through all of the mail that seems to be following me that's not my own. You tracking with me on that? So, so recently, not recently, after college, I moved to Chicago. I moved to Chicago for a school teaching job and, uh, and I moved in to an apartment with three other guys that I met. And so we, we get this apartment, we start living together and, uh, and, and of course we get our mail. And as we're picking up our mail in the first few weeks, I'm noticing my name, all the other people's names, and then we're noticing this one name that's like, who, who is this name? And her name's Katie Romero. And all of a sudden we get some letters and we're like, ah, that's not me. Uh, but then we start to, to get a lot more things that are addressed to Katie. Like we start getting Bed Bath & Beyond coupons and we're like, okay, cool. I don't really know. That's not for me, but I'll take it, I guess, right? And then it starts to become an educational process. Like we start getting these things called Sephora ads. I don't know. I have no idea what that even is, but I started to learn what cos- cosmetics were all about. And, uh, and I was like, okay, cool. Uh, Sephora, that's not relevant to four teachers that are living in Chicago. I mean, then we were getting things like Planet Fitness membership letters. We were like, man, who is this Katie Romero? And we started to get, I mean, we literally got in the mail one time a Victoria's Secret magazine and we were like, man, I don't know if Satan is behind the United States Postal Service, <laughs> but we were experiencing some major spiritual warfare because that's not me, right? This is not who it's supposed to go to. And I think for many of us in the room tonight, for being honest, When we hear about the topic of generosity, we think the same way. When we hear someone talk about this concept of generosity and giving, sometimes our instinctive reaction is to say, hey, that that message is not for me. I think that's for someone else. That's not a message for me. And, and, And we think just like Sephora ads aren't applicable to a household of four guys. We say, hey, at least not right now, the conversation of me giving away things is not relevant to my life as a young adult. And I think the reason we feel this way is threefold. First off, some of us are sitting in the room here tonight and we say, hey bro, this is your first time here, you may not know me, but I have student loan debts. Did you know that the average student loan debts is $40,000? I'm working a double job, I have debt that I'm paying, I can't be generous right now. I don't think you get it. I'm trying to pay rent and just get by. Generosity, great concept, thanks for teaching, not for me. Other, of a, other people in the room tonight may say, hey, I don't think you realize, at least for those live here, that we live in Dallas. Like, have you realized that the average vehicle driving on the roads right now is a Range Rover, and I drive a 20-year-old Camry? It's not making sense, okay? The standard of living that I am trying to catch up to and that I am trying to achieve is not one that I currently have. And so as I try to elevate my standard of living and chase after that, then I'll be able to elevate my standard of giving, but not right now. And I think the last group of us, we'd say, hey, thanks for sharing this, but I think I'm generous already. Thanks for presenting that idea, giving me that piece of mail, but it's not addressed to me because, bro, I am generous. You know, I, I give good birthday presents and I give to that one guy that one time and so... Thank you, but pass your note along to someone else. And, uh, and, and I think I'm exempt from that because of some perceived percentage, standard, or amount. 
And I'll just be honest with you guys. We don't know each other because I haven't communicated here ever. But God, over these last few weeks, has grown my heart, truly. God, over these last few weeks, as I've been studying the scriptures on what it means to be generous, God has grown my heart. He has wrecked my heart on this topic. Because I showed up, and, and I would have thought the last thing. I would have thought, you know, I, I think I'm pretty generous. I think I do a pretty great job of giving myself my resources away. But as I looked at what God's word said, I realized I, I don't think I'm as generous as I thought I was. I don't think I'm generous at all, according to what God says. And it's not because I don't make enough money. It's because I don't fully grasp what God has done for me and his intention for my life. And I realized that I wasn't stealing from God as much as my lack of generosity was stealing from me. And I say that in full sincerity. And I'll elaborate that on a little bit later, but, but you need to know that you don't have some field expert prodigy in generosity speaking to you tonight. You have a, a peer under construction, growing in obedience to this concept. And I'm excited to tell you what I've learned so far. I'm excited to tell you how God's shaping and reshaping my heart. And I'm excited to tell you who God is and challenge you and call you to an abundant life that he would have for you. The Bible says that generosity, if you and I are unable to practice it and experience it, it's going to rob you both in this life and the next. And there's no better time to be generous than right now. And most of you, when you hear that, all you think about is money. Church just wants my money. God just wants my money. And it's so much more than money. And if we don't understand what true generosity is, we're gonna miss out on the true life that God has intended for us. And so tonight, we're gonna look specifically at this idea of generosity, and we're gonna continue it in the series, The Remnant. And we're gonna look at three things that it relates to this idea of generosity. The first one comes from Acts chapter four. So if you have a Bible, you can follow along in the book of Acts. It's in the New Testament. Acts is the book that talks specifically uh, about the birth of the church, the remnant, the early church that immediately follows the life of Christ. And in chapter four, we get a really, really good picture at how this remnant operated. And so in chapter four, verse 32, follow along. Now the full number of those who believed were one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were landowners or had houses, they sold them, and they brought the proceeds of what was sold, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. My first point from the text tonight is this, that true generosity marks the people of God. True generosity marks the people of God. It's so easy for us to glaze over what I just read and to not think and understand how that practically plays itself out and just how insane that lifestyle was. Like I'm in commercial real estate. I work in the commercial real estate industry. I don't think I've ever come across someone who was like, yeah, I own this building and um, I'm just gonna give it away. I'm just gonna sell it and give it uh, to that guy. And uh, actually just take the money and just give it to the church. My mom, she's a realtor. She helps people buy and sell homes. I don't think she's ever come across someone who's like, yep, we're just gonna sell our home. Uh, no, we're not looking to expand. We're, we're not looking to get another second story or another house for our car. Uh, we're, just, we're just gonna sell it because we follow this guy named Jesus. And you know we know this guy named John and he was in need and we just thought, it was our job to care for him. And so we're selling our house and uh, we'll all go live in an apartment. And uh, that's crazy, right? You don't hear that happening in our world today. And that's how it was. They were selling the things that they had. They, I mean, you think about it, Jerusalem, they weren't known for their lake houses back in that day, right? They weren't known for their second and third homes. These people weren't giving out of excess they were giving their essentials, the things that were necessary for them to operate and function out of their daily and normal lives. And if any of this happened today in church, it would, it would make news, front page news, right? I mean, if, if people today were like, guys, we're all gonna get the same bank account. Hey, what's your name? I'm Graham. 
nice to meet you. Jerry? Yeah, okay, cool. Nice to meet you, buddy. And, uh, and like, we're going to put all of our funds together. Yep, we're doing it. Uh, like, that would be called a cult. People would say that's, that's a cult. And uh, it's so radical. It just doesn't make sense to our American individualistic mindset that's so focused on the word mine and not the word ours. Uh, and we just don't understand community. I mean, we look at that and we say that's irresponsible at least. And we say that that is flat out stupid at most. And yet, that's the way the people of God thought. They said, everything that we own is not our own. Everything that we have is not our own. And we said, they said, hey, we're not meant to be a reservoir, but a river. And what I mean by that is we're not meant to just be an accumulator of things that just accumulates more and more stuff, but we're meant to be a funnel through which the things that we have just flows through our hands consistently to give to those in need. They just said, we're gonna be a river. And that's insane. And some of you tonight may be sitting there and say, all right, let's just address the reality of this. It sounds like that's socialism, okay? It sounds like what they're, what they're doing is socialism. Here's the difference. This is not government-mandated socialism, all right? This was people that were moved. They were motivated to do this. They weren't forced to do it. They said we're moved by something, by someone, and we're gonna give everything so that all of us have everything in common and there is no needy person among them. And it marked them. This last weekend I traveled to Gulf Shores, Alabama, a road trip with four other friends who I went to college with and we went east and went to Gulf Shores, Alabama. And you know how you can identify someone who is from Gulf Shores, Alabama? By their southern accent and their mullet. And uh, I'm, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. But, but I mean, if, if you, not, a, not a comedian. Thought that would work. Anyways, but what, uh, truly though, we were on the beach and we're like, man, I mean, you could tell immediately when people would open their mouths and you'd see three missing teeth. I'm just kidding there too. Just kidding there too. <laughs> Love Alabama. Love Alabama. No, but they would, they would open their mouth and they'd speak and you'd hear this twang, right? You hear this Southern twang and you'd be like, I know where your home is. I know where you're from. And I'm not from that home, right? And in the same way, in the same way, people of God, just like the people of Alabama are marked by their accents, the people of God are marked, are identified obviously by their radical generosity. And you can tell where their home is. You can tell where they're from. That it just doesn't make sense that they just might not be from this place and that they live in a way that's different. I wanna ask you tonight, are you marked by generosity? Like if you thought about it and, and, and you had actually the courage to ask your friend who you came with, and you said, hey, is generosity something that marks me? Like when you're describing me to people, are you just describing my hair color and how tall I am? Or is generosity a descriptive word or a concept that you would mention when you're telling others about me, is generosity, the fact that you are willing to give things away normal and in your life. The concept was so foreign to us, it's so foreign to us of what the early church was like. It's almost like we just don't even have a category for it, but I think the reason why it's even more foreign is because we've lowered the bar. We've lowered the bar of generosity. I've asked people lately over this last month these three questions, and I'd love to ask them to you. These are the three questions that I've asked people in conversation. I've asked coworkers, roommates, close friends, college friends, you name it, porchies, all the people that on Tuesday, I will literally just ask people this, these questions. And it's this, do you think that you're generous? This is question number one. Do you think you're generous? Number two, do you think that others would think that you're generous? Question number three, do you think that God thinks that you're generous? And you know what's crazy? As I asked all sorts of different circles of people, I got similar answers, similar answers. Most people would say, generically, yes, I think I'm generous. Uh, I don't know whether or not I think my friends think I'm generous, and probably not. I don't think that God thinks that I'm generous. But here's what was even crazier, is when I would ask why, and I'd say, hey, why do you think that? 
the answers were insanely different. And the, the logic that people will say, hey, this is why I think I'm different. See if you see yourself in any of these. Some answers that I got on why people thought they were different. I think I'm generous because I give more than the average person. According to what I know, I think I give a little bit more. I think I'm generous because I live on less means than other people, relatively. Uh, I save more than most people. I think, you know, I'm a saver, so I spend less on myself, and so I think I'm generous because of that. Here's one of my favorites. I think I'm generous because I started doing my, friend, my girlfriend's laundry. I literally had someone tell me that. I think I'm generous because I, I've started to do my girlfriend's laundry. Um, I give great birthday presents. I think that I'm generous because I am the best at giving great birthday presents on the birthdays that I remember. I think that I'm generous because I walk my neighbor's dog sometimes. You know, like when they're out of town, like I'll walk them once or twice. I think I'm generous. I usually say yes when people ask for money. Or maybe this is you. When I'm at CVS and they ask after I've purchased something if you'd like to donate a dollar, I always say yes. That's me. I always do that, right? I had someone that was like, hey, when they always ask for that SPCA, like, like help the, you know, stray kittens, I'm always there. I say yes every time, saving it one dollar at a time. That's me. I'm generous. And we look at what the Bible says, right? And they're giving fields, houses, their very essentials away. And we're doing laundry and we're calling it generous. And, and it's just like, man, maybe they aren't the crazy ones. Maybe they aren't crazy and, say, and, and, and for us to think that they were living a generous life. Maybe we're the crazy ones and our standard is embarrassing, embarrassingly low. We're the richest people in all of human history by all historical accounts. And when we look at the first century church, that was poor. It's like we're playing on a different scoreboard. Right, almost all examples that we have in reference to our generosity are giving in excess and everything that they were doing was giving sacrificially, out of need, out of what they had to live. And that's what marked them. So what does it look like for you today in 2018? What does it look like for us to be generous, to give sacrificially? Let's look together at what Paul says to the words of Timothy, which are found in 1 Timothy Chapter six, Paul says this, as for the rich in this day, which is you and I, by all historic accounts, even if you don't feel like it, that's us. As for the rich in this day, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be generous, there to do good, be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that, that, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. The second point from the text tonight is this. True generosity is about how you live, not just the money you give. True generosity is about how you live, not just the money you give. There are three categories that the Bible gives with how we're to be rich towards God, and that's with our time, our talent, and our treasure. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. And so we'll start with our time. We all have 24 hours in a day. We all seemingly have jam-packed calendars that need to be scheduled. How can you give your time? Maybe it looks like leading a Bible study of college students this summer. Maybe it looks like giving your time on Wednesday nights, like I know so many of you already do, to helping disciple junior high and high school students. Maybe it looks like getting involved in different parts of our city, like South Dallas at Mercy Street, mentoring kids. How can you give your time that's not your own for other people generously? Let's look at talent, what unique experiences that only you have, giftings that only you have. We're at this stage of life where we probably have figured out whether we're good at singing or we're not good at singing, whether we are gonna make it to professional sports or not, whether we had an engineering path or we just can't get it right with the numbers. 
and we know what we're good at and we know the experiences that we've alone been given that we can use and utilize. Maybe you're a nurse. Maybe you serve at Quest Care at a clinic nearby in a way that I never could as a real estate broker. Maybe you're an attorney and you partner with some of my friends at ACT and you help rewrite and reshape the judicial system in our city here locally and help those who are unable to help themselves. Maybe you're like some of the artists here that have given their time to make everything that you see tonight exceptionally great that you have no idea about. You just got excited about that launch video. You just got excited about the bumper videos, all of the details that you see here. That's done by people who are paid to do that on a daily basis. And yet they're so sold out and they believe in the cause of Christ that they say, I wanna donate. I wanna give everything that I'm excellent at so that Jesus can be known and so that thousands can experience it. That's what people do here with their talent. What can you do? What do you have that you can give? And your treasure, somewhat self-explanatory and it goes without saying, but how are you distributing your money? How are you giving your funds to the kingdom of God? Are you giving your money to the kingdom of God? Are you actually doing it? Are you holding it? As I, as I said earlier, this is something that as I go through these things, when I went through these things, I thought I was generous and I kind of went in that order and that's why I thought initially that I was generous because I said, you know what? I give my time. I serve here. I help out in different ways. I give my time. I know what I'm gifted at and I give that freely and I love to do it and it fires me up and so I'm generous. And then that last part, treasure. And I said, Mm, I, I don't like to do that. I, if I was speaking of my preferences and being honest, I would much rather give $10,000 worth of my time than $10,000 of my dollars. I just don't want to do it. It's, it's the truth. I just don't want to do that. And, I, and, I, and here's, the, here's the reality that I need to confess to you guys is that I let that preference bleed into a faulty priority that I for the last year just said, hey, because I do these things, because I give in these other ways, I am justified and exempt from giving financially. That was me. I neglected giving to this place because I said, I already give of myself. And so they don't need my dollars. They already have my time. And I wanna tell you, God wasn't missing out. I was, I was missing out. For as much joy as it gives me to give my time and my talents, it gives me joy when I give my money as well. I can tell you that where your treasure goes, your heart will go also, I know that, and yet for some reason, for some reason, for a long time, I said not here, and I made excuses. I made excuses, and that changed this last weekend in Gulf Shores, Alabama, of all places. I went with those friends and we talked about our money and we said, what do we have? And what are we doing with it? We asked the questions, what are we gonna do with the money that God has given us? And I got to confess to my friends and say, guys, I don't think I'm doing it right. And it's not because I see that y'all are. I see that God has given me so much and that for some reason there is a mistranslation. That for some reason I don't fully grasp who God is and the generosity is given because I'm holding something back. And I get to confess that, and I get to make a change, and make a plan, and and gather accountability, and take a step, and actually click the button, and actually give dollars. And we get to do that together, and it was amazing. So maybe you can follow that process. Maybe it's not money, but it's anything else. That if you're sitting here and you're like, man, I recognize that I am withholding something. That God's not demanding But he's asking, he's saying, if you want to live the abundant life, it's found through giving, not getting. And and maybe for you, if you are recognizing some area of that, a great next step is to gather people around and confess that. And to say, I'm I'm not living as as I should. I'm not living as I say I should. And I wanna tell you what's going on. And I want to do something about it. I wanna change.
and gather accountability and lock arms with people that are going to help point you in a different direction. The reality is I, I didn't have a behavior problem this last year. I had a belief problem. There was a fault in my belief that I didn't fully understand the goodness of God. And so let's take a look at the why of generosity, the belief behind the behavior. And it comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Paul is writing to this church in Corinth. It's culturally like modern-day Las Vegas. He calls them to be, the church isn't, the city is where that church is. And he's calling them to be generous. And this is what he says in verse 9. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. My last point tonight from the text is that true generosity is a response to God's generosity. True generosity is a response to God's generosity. Paul's point here is that because you know the generosity of Jesus, because of what he's done, he's associating our act with an act that's already been done before us and to us. He's saying the why of giving is because someone else has given to you. You know what he does not say? He doesn't say you give to earn your way to heaven. The Bible doesn't say that. He doesn't say you give because it makes you feel really good. It doesn't say that. He doesn't say you give so that you get a tax write-off and a benefit financially. He does not say that. He says you give because of what Jesus has given to you. That God, very God of very God, became man. He took on human flesh and he gave you his very life. And in response to that, not as a requirement, but in response, you give your life freely to him. And so in summary, true generosity marks the people of God. True generosity is about the life that you live, not just the money that you give. And true generosity is a response to God's generosity. I want to close with a story that I found that was just mind-blowing to me, that really relates to this third point and then the overall message. It's about a guy two or three weeks ago, about a guy named James Harrison. I don't know if you read it much uh, about Australians, but this guy is an Australian guy. And... Um, when he was a teenager in the 60s, 1960s, he had a life and death moment where he had to go into some really intense surgery. Wasn't gonna make it. They needed someone to donate blood and some anonymous person decided to donate their blood and it saved James Harrison's life. He was so moved by that reality that someone he didn't even know would give their very life for his. And so he said, man, I wanna give in response to that. I wanna give because because someone's shown amazing kindness to me. Shortly thereafter, there was a problem in Australia where a lot of the um, expecting mothers, pregnant women in the country, um, a, a part of the complications that were happening at that time, they, they, these medical experts said, hey, I think your blood type, you have a unique blood type, and I think that it might be the solution to this problem. Would you give that? And he said, absolutely. And so he gave his blood once a week for 60 years straight. The only reason we know about this story is because two weeks ago, he retired from giving blood and it wasn't even because he chose to. It was because by Australian law, you can't give blood past 81 years old. <laughs> Insanity, right? Insanity, and so they flip back and they say, man, this guy's given for how, 60 years, how, every, every week, oh my gosh. And they, and they roll back the tape and they recognize and realize that James Harrison, through his blood donations, saved 2.4 million babies with his blood, one of which was his own granddaughter. And you listen to that and you're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing, 2.4 million lives, I could never do that. Or you're like, 2.4 million lives, I wanna save that tomorrow. I want to do something great now. I don't want to wait 60 years when I'm 81 and old and boring. I want to do that now. And the reality is, it probably wasn't that sexy showing up every week, having your arm inserted with a needle 
and taking a little bit of blood. It probably wasn't that impressive. It probably wasn't that exciting. But consistent faithfulness over a long period of time yielded an amazing impact. And if you are impressed by an 80-year-old man who saved 2.4 million babies because of his blood, then, then you need to know the man that has saved more than that by a long shot, offering salvation with his blood by a long shot. Ultimate Jesus juke here. But Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came to earth. He came and he offered his life completely. He lived a perfect life. And he said, I wanna give it for people that don't know me and that won't respond to me. I'm gonna give it to them anyways. I'm gonna give them everything. I'm not just gonna give some of my blood that's gonna be a benefit to them so that they can have a better life. I'm gonna give my entire self so that they can live with me for eternity. He offers that freely and he wants you to know him not as a requirement so you'll feel guilty and obligated like you have to pay a God tax and give some of your money away, but so that you will experience the life that he intended for you, that you will experience the life of generosity that when you give, you will realize it's more blessed to do so than to receive. And so my plea for you tonight is that for those who don't know that, that you would look at the cross that you would look at Jesus and you would realize, man, there's something that that guy did. And inside of my messed up brokenness, this guy pursues to know me and offers me more than the prestige of Dallas ever could or success in my 20s and 30s ever will. And I want you to see the cross and see his generosity, that he is infinitely more generous than, than James Harrison ever will be. And he offers that to you who he knows. And for those in the room tonight who who do know that generosity, who do know that kindness that was shown to you, I hope that this motivates you. I hope that this, that further just convicts and stirs your heart and says, man, I want to give more of myself. I wanna be more of a river and less of a reservoir. I don't wanna hold on to stuff anymore. I wanna let it go through because that's what God's called me to. That's the life that he's offered us, that he has died for. Let me pray for us. Thank God, I pray for my friends. I pray that we would know that there is nothing that we can do to please you. There's no amount of money that we can give away that's gonna wow you. We don't ask for money, God. You want us to respond to your generosity. You are the giver. It's not us. It's you. So I pray for my friends in the room that they would know that generosity, that they would respond to it, that they would not do so in isolation, that they wouldn't just say, man, generosity is this this lifestyle and virtue that I practice on my own. I pray that they would realize that it is best practiced in community. And I pray that they would experience the fullness of life that they would realize that it is better to give than to receive and that things would change tonight, that plans would be made and that action steps would be taken. I pray that tonight. It's your name we pray all these things, God. Amen.